Well, welcome to another edition of the Media Twits. I'm Mark Glazer, Executive Editor of PBS Media Shift, back from uh, paternity leave with a uh, new baby son, Everett, who is uh, causing a lot of ruckus around the house. But I'm glad to be back here on Media Twits. I want to thank uh, Andrew Lee for uh, jumping in as a, a guest host for a couple weeks. Um, and it's good to be back here. Um, we have a really interesting show this week. We're going to be talking to Earl Norton, who is the new executive producer of ABC News Digital, to hear about what's going to be happening at ABC and kind of the future of broadcast channels in the digital age. We'll also be talking to Mark Schuess, who is the new uh, head of the investigations unit at BuzzFeed, kind of an unlikely place for investigations. We'll also be talking to Chris Kirkham, from Huffington Post. He just had an, an amazing in-depth piece on juvenile prisons. So investigative journalism happening in unlikely places. Um, so first, let's, uh, I'll introduce our uh, panel. We have Andrew Lee uh, from American University. We have Chris Kirkham, business reporter at Huffington Post. We have Claire Grodin, who's our PBS Media Shift intern. And Earl Norton, the new executive producer at ABC News Digital, and Mark Schuess, the head of investigations at BuzzFeed. Um, and before we get started, I um, just want a um, couple messages for everyone. Um, we want to thank uh, USC Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, now offering a nine-month Master of Journalism degree program. Be a part of a new era in journalism and digital media communication studies. To learn more, visit annenberg.usc.edu. We also want to let you know about a big event happening in New York City next month. Media Shift and Pointer invite you to a special symposium and reception in New York City at the Ford Foundation headquarters on November 13th at 6.30 p.m. It's called Truth and Trust in the 21st Century looking at how ethical decisions are made in traditional and non-traditional newsrooms. Speakers include Pointer's Kelly McBride, NYU's Clay Shirky, and Craigslist founder Craig Newmark. Go to bit.ly slash truth trust to learn more about our event and to RSVP. We hope to see a lot of you there. Now let's get into the show. Um, first let's talk about Earl Norton. Um, he comes from Reuters. Uh, video unit and headed video there and now he's moving over to ABC News Digital um, to try to push into more verticals to really promote more video. Um, Earl, what attracted you to uh, AB News, ABC News Digital? Uh, I, I think this is in many ways the chance of a lifetime. Um, it was, I mean first of all it's ABC News which I mean that brand is incredibly powerful and so when I started talking to them, it was just, it was, it was immediately a compelling um, opportunity, an incredibly compelling opportunity. And because ABC News is already doing so many great things, but there's so much more we can do. And um, I mean, I really felt like this was, this was one of those, I, I hate to keep saying it, but one of those once in a lifetime uh, opportunities. And so some people talk about, you know, criticize ABC um, for, you know, like we're looking at the homepage of ABC and seeing that, you know, Brett Farr lost his memory is a big story. Um, and when you look at some of the things in the app and some of the stuff online, um, it does seem like there's a lot of kind of what we might call kind of fluffy stories, stories that kind of look to get a lot of hits, maybe not as serious journalism as we expect from ABC. What, what do you think about kind of the way that things play out online and what gets highlighted um, as far as serious versus kind of lighter journalism? Uh, I, I think there is a, a very good mix here that we do both of those um, and I think we do both of those very well. I mean it is, it's, I, I will, I will say, tell you that we're working right now on a project with the um, uh, overseas team uh, that's going to be very serious journalism and um, it's going to be really, really strong work. And when the my first, I think it was my first week here, 
when the shooting happened in Washington, or the woman tried to drive into the White House and, and was eventually shot. Um, I mean, that's real news. That's hard news. And we were all over it. I mean, the newsroom out there was going crazy. It was, it was absolutely great. So um, do we have a mix? Absolutely. But um, I, I think that mix is important because that mix is what people care about. And what about video? Um, you obviously focused on that at Reuters, and I mean, when you think of ABC as a broadcaster, there's a lot of video coming from ABC um, and ABC News specifically. What is your strategy around, you know, there's obviously a lot of video already on ABCnews.com, um, and I know there's been some original video done with Yahoo. Um, there's a power player show that you have. It's a pretty well produced show and kind of in, you know a political show. Um, what else do you have planned as far as video goes? Well, I, I don't want to give away all the plans, but there will be, <laughs> there will be more original um, programming. Um, there'll there'll be quite a bit more, as a matter of fact. Um, we're just in the the kind of the early stages of putting that plan together. Um, and, and there are a lot of different ways to do it. I mean, that's that's one of the key things is that um, online you've got you've got so many more ways to play um, with video, and we're going to be doing a lot of that. Andrew, did you want to jump in on kind of the the competitors to ABC News Online now? Yeah, Eric. I, mean, I think I was wondering what who you thought was doing it well now. I used to do video training for the journal and they were trying to do personal stories and mini docs but then they've kind of gone to live TV and and folks have experimented with, with those types of models. Who do you think is doing it well right now in terms of models that are not typically television video? Well it's funny you mentioned the journal. I, I, I would say uh, the journal is doing a good job. I mean I it's whether that sort of Live works. I'm not sure at this point, um, but I, I do. I do think they do really nice work. Um, it's it's a nice model of having the live shows and then cutting up pieces of that and putting it on stories. Um, it it seems to have worked well for them, and that's that's one of the places that uh, is doing a good job. But I mean, there are a lot of startups that are beginning to do some really interesting things in video as well. No doubt. And what do you think about kind of the business model aspect of uh, ABC News Digital? Um, you know, are there, is it something that you always have free? Do you think there might be a paywall of some sort or other types of things you might do? What, what you know, do you think that will change at some point? Uh, I don't have any indication that that's going to change. Um, and, uh, you know, at this point I'm just so focused on what we're doing on the editorial side that um, that I haven't given that much thought. But I, I, I you know, could that change? I, I have a hard time seeing that. But but again, who knows? And talk about a little bit how you guys work with Yahoo. Um, I know you've only been there a little while, but. That's an interesting partnership, and I know last year at one point there was an announcement that you know ABC plus Yahoo News is the largest news network online. What what exactly does that mean, and how do you you know how do you kind of work in concert with such a large you know two large news organizations, one a native online and one a broadcaster? How do you work together? Well, I mean you're right. It's you know I'm I'm only. This is week four, so um, this is a little bit new to me too. But but I, the sides we work together really well. Um, it is because what happens is is that it comes down to a few people who are doing this. I mean, there there are a few people on each side who are constantly talking and going back and forth. And so while it's two big organizations, um, it's those few people. Um, who make it work on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, so, you know, it, it it seems to work very, very well. And it, it, Yahoo's been a great partner. And you talked about mixing in investigative work, and I know you know Brian Ross is at ABC News and has done a lot of good work over the years. And we're going to talk um, to Chris and Mark also about investigations going on at newer outlets. 
Um, is investigative journalism still, you know, where, what role does it play um, both at ABC News and online and in digital and new forms of investigative journalism? Is that something you guys will look at? Yeah, it definitely is. As a matter of fact, I was, uh, because I've, I've spent so much of my time in the first few weeks here meeting people, I was um, downstairs yesterday meeting with people in Brian's group, and they are very excited about um, some of the things that, uh, that we want to do. So I, I, that, that continues to be something very important to ABC News, and I think there, I think there is a lot more we can do online with that. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Earl. Appreciate you joining us, um, and we'll definitely keep a lookout on what happens at ABC and ABC and Yahoo together. It'll be an interesting time. Great. Thank you very much for having me. Sure thing. So now let's turn to a talk about what's happening um, with BuzzFeed um, and its new kind of head of investigations, Mark Schuess, who comes from ProPublica. Um, Mark, what made you decide uh, to take this kind of job as head of investigations at BuzzFeed? It seems like a little unusual place to be. Actually, I don't think so. Um, as you know better than anyone, the web is, is changing. And we have the legacy media. I was at the Wall Street Journal for 11 years as a foreign correspondent and an investigative reporter before I went to ProPublica two years ago. And, you know, those the papers such as the New York Times or, you know, as Earl is just saying, ABC, they still have terrific brands and they do excellent journalism. Uh, I went to ProPublica, which is kind of a, a hybrid. As you know, it's a nonprofit investigative news outfit. Uh, that has no print at all. We're completely online. And, you know, in five years, ProPublica won two Pulitzer Prizes and has done fantastic work. And I'm very proud to have been a part of it for these last two years. I work with terrific people, great writers, uh, and it's fantastic. But BuzzFeed sort of offers the chance to bring investigative reporting to an entirely new, I think it's only four years old, BuzzFeed's only four years old, an entirely new media outfit that is growing. I mean, it started, as I said, four years ago, and now it has 130 journalists. It's just hired a foreign editor and hired reporters in Moscow and Istanbul and Cairo, and, uh, you know, uh, it's open French language editions and Spanish language editions, and they have an office in London, and they have a 24-hour news desk now. And I mean, why shouldn't they do investigative reporting? Good point. Um, Andrew, did you want to jump in with something? Yeah, I, I think that's really fascinating to see the evolution of how you've gone from the journal to ProPublica and now to BuzzFeed, which seems like it's the, the most, um, it's the most, uh, you know, engaged, it's the most engaged, uh, you know, crowd that you will have versus ProPublica. So I'm wondering, is there any, are there any plans to, to do that, to use that crowd in some way, or to engage them in, in helping with investigative work? Yeah, I mean, remember that, this, you know, I accepted the job on Monday, and I don't start for several weeks. So to ask me exactly how we're going to do that, I don't know. Uh, but you know, there's 80 million unique visitors to BuzzFeed every month. Uh, so you have two opportunities. You have an opportunity to tap in to those uh, readers as sources, which people, of course, always do um, in, in, in any news organization now. And also, you have, hopefully, the chance to reach those people with terrific news that will inform their you know, decisions as citizens, whether, to, uh, whether it's to vote or where to shop in terms of a, a you know, whether they want to support a particular company or, 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 or whatever it is. So I think there's, there's, there's sort of two opportunities with a, with a readership that's that gigantic. And one is to help the journalism through sources, and the other is to inform. And, uh, and if there is something that we uncover that, that is universally agreed as an outrage, hopefully there will be a groundswell to, to change that. And what about BuzzFeed's kind of, most people think of it as a pretty kind of lightweight site. I mean, when you think about the branding behind it, um, it's not something people typically think about. 
for investigations, and I mean, they've taken some heat over using images and kind of the rights behind those images. I mean, was that something you took into account when you thought about going to work there? Well, so those are two different questions, so let's take them one at a time. Sure. That it has a brand, a brand for being light. I would just say the New Yorker publishes cartoons, and no one thinks it doesn't do great work. So you can publish cat videos, and you can publish a hard-hitting report. I mean, look at McKay Coppin's terrific report this morning on uh, uh, how the Pope is creating a schism within the American conservative movement. It's a terrific piece. It would be at home anywhere in any publication, whether it was the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, the ProPublica, ABC News, Huffington Post. It would have a great home, and it's and it's featured on the top of the homepage, and it should be. But the um, New Yorker, the, the cartoons of the New Yorker are kind of the gravy on top of a lot of heavy-hitting reporting. I mean, BuzzFeed, you could, in that same parallel, I mean, the, the cartoons and the things that really draw people have nothing to do with investigative reporting or even reporting at all. So it's a little bit of a different kind of model. Well, I think that when BuzzFeed got started, that is, in fact, what was, and I can't speak for BuzzFeed because I'm not even officially employed at BuzzFeed, so I want to make, this is, this is my view as someone who looks at the site, okay? So as someone who looks at the site and, you know, has watched it evolve, they only began to do news roughly 18 months ago. I might have that slightly off by a few months, but roughly 18 months ago when they hired Ben Smith. Now, if you look at, at the content since that time, of course, there will always be the great fun stuff, you know, the drunk versus stone video, which has had I don't know how many million hits, or, you know, the, the listicles of, you know, whatever it happens to be. And, there, and by the way, if you think that's easy to do, I challenge you right now to come up with a listicle or a video that will get a million hits. It's not easy. I would say it's as difficult to do that as it is to write one of those witty, fantastic New Yorker cartoons. Uh, you know, look, I don't do, for example, fashion, as you can probably tell by the, you know, shirt I'm wearing or whatever, but we would all agree that people who do that have a talent, and it's not particularly easy to do that. So first of all, I want to say that, that writing that kind of stuff, it ain't easy. It may look easy, but it ain't. So that's number one. Number two, if you look back at the great old newspapers, they were always a mix. You know, they had the comics, they had Dear Abby, they had recipes, they had, you know, whatever they had. I worked at the Village Voice, but frankly, people read for the personal ads. So, you know, please tell me that this has always been some, you know, totally serious thing where you only did, you know, it was never like that. It was always in the mix, as Tina Brown would say. So. You know, they started, instead of starting with serious, they started with stuff that was uh, entertaining and cool, and now they're moving into serious. To me, that's fantastic. You know, these are people who, who have developed a gigantic audience, and they want to use that audience and, and inform that audience with the best of traditional American journalism, which is what I hope to bring to BuzzFeed, and what BuzzFeed wants me to bring. Uh, 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 to to it. Fair enough. So let's talk to Chris. Let's bring you in because Huffington Post, which was also founded by Jonah Peretti, co-founded by Jonah Peretti, and and also founded BuzzFeed, has already gone down this path of starting. Uh, in this case, in Buffington Post case, it was with a lot of blogs by well-known people, just hundreds and hundreds of blogs, and then they started kind of an investigative fund and started investigative reporting. Um, how, how has that worked out there, and how do you, what do you feel about the way things have changed there? They won a Pulitzer Prize last year, um, and you have an amazing piece out now, um, Prisoners of Profit. What, what, first, just before we get to your piece, talk a little bit about just how investigative reporting, how it's sprung up in Huffington Post and where it is now. Yeah, I mean, it really kind of, it, it started, I would say, I mean, we've had reporters uh, going back to the 2008 campaign. Uh, Sam Stein, our uh, reporter down in D.C., uh, has covered the White House since then. Um, I would say really it was in 2010, kind of before AOL purchased us, that uh, there was kind of like a, an idea that we had kind of, I, I don't know, I think revenue-wise, it was a little, we were a little more comfortable with the idea of hiring our own 
staff. And I was kind of brought in on that first wave. Um, I was a reporter at the Times Picayune uh, in New Orleans for about four years. So um, you know, I had a I had a good job. I enjoyed my job. Uh, really liked doing local reporting, but then I had the opportunity uh, as they were starting to build out uh, to, to come on board. Um, and so we, I mean, we have a, we have a huge reporting staff now. I mean, we have, uh, I believe in, in New York, we have probably 20 reporters. I think in DC we have, uh, I'm, I'm going to get this wrong, but I, I want to say in DC we have almost 30. So we have a reporting staff of around 50. Uh, we have some really good editors here. Um, and so, I mean, it, it does take some time to evolve uh, when you staff up, but, um, but I think, you know, I, I've been given opportunities uh, to do this kind of work here that I think a lot of journalists uh, at, at other news organizations, um, you know, the, there just aren't the resources for it anymore. So um, I've, you know, it's really been a pleasure in that way for me. And how does it differ, I guess, from doing the work you did before at a newspaper? Um, I mean, a newspaper depends on you know having circulation having something to print it out to send to people I mean now it's at Huffington Post this is online only again it kinda depends on bringing in kind of viral stories and, and a lot of advertising um, does that change in any way the way the newsroom works or do you feel it's pretty similar to what happened at the Times Picayune? I mean it's it's obviously different I mean you're the production is completely different I mean you, you don't have you don't have a deadline to print the paper, so you can be putting up stories at any time. And and so the time, you know, the timing of when you want stories to go out, you know, you have to think a little bit more about uh, traffic. You know, when are people going to be engaged on the site? Uh, you know, what are the what are the peak times for that? But really, I mean, as far as the just news gathering, reporting, and editing process, um, you know, it's it's very similar to what, what we had at the Times Picayune. I mean, and it's, it's I mean, I, the, the editors who I've gotten to work with here, uh, you know, are, are in many ways, uh, you know, better. I mean, I, I feel like I've, I've learned a lot since coming here. I mean, it was, it was a good move. Uh, and I, and learning about the web too. I mean, uh, I, I'm not, I, I'm not the most web savvy person. You know, I, I still kind of am a little old school in my reporting techniques. Um, but I think it's been good because, uh, you know, our audience is always looking for just, Different, different kinds of stories, and and so I, I think I, I think when we do this kind of work, I think it's surprising, and I think readers enjoy it, and and the fact that we have the platform that we have is, is an amazing reporting tool in itself. I think we, we're you know I've gotten amazing tips and uh, stories just from people people seeing my work and then commenting on it or sending me an email. I mean I, I get I, the number of emails that I get from from influential people, uh, you know. Since I've come to Huffington Post compared to to when I was in New Orleans, I mean, I mean, I just get, I get so much more engagement uh, than, than I than I did there when we were very plugged into the community in New Orleans. We had a really great following. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, the platform itself it, it works for journalism, which I think is great. Andrew, I'm curious what what you think about this idea of you know both Huffington Post and BuzzFeed. Um, you know, building this massive audience through kind of viral, more lightweight content, and then building kind of an investigative and reporting infrastructure afterwards. I mean, all we hear about from the newspapers and legacy organizations is, you know, you have to have a paywall if you're going to ever be able to support, you know, really serious journalism. I mean, does this kind of disprove the point? Well, um, yeah, I mean, one of the funny things is that, as Mark said, um, we already have lots of examples where light is put next to very serious. In fact, Neil Postman lamented this exactly in terms of television news, that the juxtaposition of a very serious story next to a very lighthearted story made for very, very uh, strange results in terms of uh, public consumption of news. So I think this is probably no different. At least you can sequester these things into different sections or pages or they come to you pushed and not necessarily with the other content. So they're actually consumed in isolation in, in ways that are probably more pleasing than having to consume a TV newscast. But I think the more ways we can get investigative stuff uh, done, no matter what that form is, um, is, a great, is a great benefit to us. And um, to have these units live within larger organizations that don't necessarily have to show that that section or that unit is is making a huge profit. That's going back to the old model, but that's a great one, which is that we don't necessarily have to see every story make a profit on these types of uh, uh, on on these types of things. And um, 
you're seeing more and more of this, I think, that we're going to see more investigative units open up inside other organizations, and that's a great, great trend. Absolutely. I would just, I would just add that, that it's, I think we're seeing an investigative reporting boom. Uh, I, I, you know, there, I think that Chris's story is, and by the way, congratulations, Chris, it's a wonderful story, and you should be really, really proud of it. Um, you know, we're seeing this happening, you know, across many organizations that have realized that this is a terrific public service, it's desperately needed, and they want to do it. And whether it makes money, I, my personal belief is that investigative reporting has always been and will always be non-profit. ProPublica was very honest about it, but, you know, we were always dependent upon uh, other revenue streams because it's expensive. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of money. But yeah. people recognize that they're not just in publishing uh, to make a buck. They're in publishing because they want to do something. You know, Jeff Bezos certainly did not need uh, to go into publishing, but he just bought the Washington Post, and apparently they're on a hiring spree. And and one yeah. thing that I one thing that I think is just interesting. I mean, and I I didn't know what to expect when I came here because you know we we really hadn't done. I, I mean, I mean. Huffington Post had done some very good work, and particularly in politics. I mean, they were really they were really making splashes. Um, but you know, in terms of the investigative work, like I, I didn't know if people would want to read it. You know, I, I didn't know it was like, oh, on the web, is is this just not really going to work? And I, and I've been blown away with the response that you get. I mean, so I, I mean, I, I think there's this idea that oh, you know, our audience only cares about um, you know viral videos or or things in 140 characters, and um, I, I think it's been great to kind of have the opportunity to, to disprove that because I mean the 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 pieces gr granted there I mean we can't come out with as many we can't come out with a piece like this as often as we can come out with uh, a listicle or or you know a, a mashup but um but I you know it, it does it does comparably well I would say I mean like I mean I, I just I'm curious sometimes about the traffic I try not to think about it too much but um. We get great engagement uh, on these stories, and uh, a lot of people click. So I, I think that's that's positive for investigative journalism. Yeah, I mean, we, we could we could Go have ahead. spent a whole yeah. I mean, the reason why we didn't have an episode last week was Mark and I were at the ONA conference in Atlanta, and the mood there is incredible. As Mark said, you know, there is a renaissance of a lot of this stuff happening right now. Unlike other journalism conferences of the last few years, there was it was hard to find anyone depressed or moaning about the state of the industry. Uh, there are very young, up-and-coming journalists really interested in data, in coding, in investigative. Uh, the the folks who anchored a lot of these big sessions were like Nate Silver, trying to find stories and numbers. Uh, there were people doing deeper storytelling, like New York Times and Snowfall. So it's really fascinating to see that um, there is a lot of interest, and especially younger folks, in deeper storytelling and in uh, mining information for insights and that's really encouraging to see that. Yeah and Chris let's talk a little bit about your piece and the way you that was structured because it's really interesting the way you know obviously it's it's built in a very graphical very huge kind of image way um, and when you kind of go over some of the there's like some highlighted par parts where you um, bring in some of the um, some of the documents, as you can see, when you when you kind of hover over some of the highlighted areas in your report, it brings up the actual source documents, which I thought was a really interesting way of doing it. I mean, talk a little bit about how you how that was put together and just um, what the web kind of affords you to do that you couldn't do in print. Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, this was really kind of one of the first times we tried this out, um, and I, I think just just from the nature of the uh, reporting and the story and kind of you know the, the time that we took to do it, I I, I I wanted to do something different with the presentation, and I thought, um, you know, not not that not that our normal template uh, isn't isn't great, but it also doesn't afford you the flexibility that this does. So. Um, you know, we, we have an amazing design team. We have a guy named Andre Shankman uh, who came from the New York Times. Uh, he was kind of, he really headed up the design on this. And we, we put our heads together because I, I kind of had this idea. I was like, well, I, I, I have Document Cloud. I, you know, I've annotated this stuff. I, I really would like to, to, to put it out there because I, I think sometimes it's a little... It's a little disingenuous when you're a reporter and you're you're linking to something and it's just like a 6,000-page document. And you're like, oh, hey, here you go. Here's... 
here, here's the attribution, but you know, who's going to go through that and actually look? So um, I thought I kind of wanted to put this stuff out there, and I thought, I thought by sort of being able to view it in real time as you read the story that, um, I, I don't know, I mean, it, it, I think it, it helps to bolster the case, and I think, I, I don't know, I mean, I, I think some readers, you know, could be interested to, 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 to see a little snippet that goes a little deeper without having to click through and, and uh, you know, uh, go mining through some, some sort of document that, that is really dense. Uh, you know, it kind of allows you to, to, to see what I'm seeing as a reporter, um, but kind of get, get you there quick. Yeah, it's really well presented. Mark, Mark did you want to jump in? Because I'm curious yeah. about your take on, like, that not only Prisoners of Profit, um, Chris's really interesting take on kind of the juvenile detention system and how messed up it is with private uh, prisons, but also, you know, things like Snowfall um, that show mm -hmm. this potential for ways of presenting material that didn't really exist before for investigative journalists. Right. Um, what I would say is that, so, Snowfall was, was really... In, in, my, in my humble opinion, and, and Joe, the, the editor on that project, now works uh, with me at ProPublica, um, you know, I think of that as sort of a visual presentation, whereas what Chris is talking about uh, is, is actually something that's more about bulletproofing, nailing down, showing the reader how you know what you know. And it's interesting because what Chris did with his story is something that we had done. We had a large investigation into acetaminophen, the active ingredient in Tylenol. And we obviously independently from, from Chris came up with pretty much the exact same thing. You can see in real time uh, exactly where in some very long document the, uh, the, the attribution is. And then if you click a second time, you can see the whole document so that you can know that we're not taking it out of context. It's like complete transparency to a reader, and very few of them, except maybe the targets who are looking to see if they can find a way to sue you, will probably read them all. Uh, but, but if somebody does want to see it, you know, it's there. And it's kind of telling the reader, this is serious, it's true, here's how we know it's true, here's how you know it's true. It's verifiability, which is, to my, to my mind, the, you know, the, the you know, the most important part about, about doing good journalism. But what about the visual aspects? Because, um, you know, there could also be, you know, video interviews, there could be audio from the interviews, there's a lot more right. you can and, kind of pack we, in. So we we do all of that. You, and so, yeah. does, so does Huffington Post, and I think basically every web organization now does all of that. As you're reading through, when you get to the right spot, right there is an interactive that lets you see how the data works, or right there is a video of somebody, you know, testifying in front of Congress, or, you know, what, 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 whatever it is. Um, and that's, that's obviously something that, that now I think you kind of have to do. I mean, it's sort of expected that you'll do that, and, and I'm looking forward to doing the first investigative listicle. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be really interesting to kind of mix listicles into investigations. I mean, absolutely. As, as Chris was saying, I mean, he was impressed by the, you know, by the way that people engaged with investigations on Huffington Post. I mean, and I know Upworthy has tried to be kind of a viral place for good. I mean, do you believe, Mark, that you know investigations can get the kind of virality that you talked about with the million views and the you know all that, or is it something that always will be kind of more of a niche? You know, I don't know. Um, some of the things that at ProPublica have had more than a million views, dollars for docs, for instance. Um, uh, you know, uh, our Tylenol series is you know a couple hundred thousand and counting. Um, you know, so I think that we can certainly hit very large numbers. And I, I was at the Wall Street Journal and and know what a page one story would get. And, uh, you know, I, it was rare that it hit a million, I can tell you that for sure. Um, and so, you know, w you don't necessarily have to hit five million to have impact, number one. Number two, I think it'll be really interesting to work with BuzzFeed to find out if it can hit that kind of, of numbers. I, I hope very much that Chris's hits a million. I hope it hits five million. It's a terrific piece of work that, that five million people should read. Um, but I, I think part of this is 
art and part of it is pure chance. Does it hit the zeitgeist correctly? And then part of it is presentation and, and pushing it out there through all of the, the ways that, that, that you know, the, the, the social wizards are able to do these days. I unfortunately yeah. am going to have to kind of um, beg out because I have a phone call that's coming in in just a couple of minutes. Is that no problem? Okay? Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for joining us, Mark. We really appreciate terrific. it. Terrific. And I and I enjoyed it. And thank you very very much for having me. And again, Chris, congratulations on your story. Thanks a lot, Mark, and congrats to you. Thanks, Chris. Did you want to jump in with with thoughts on that about kind of the stories going viral and getting more more views? Sure. Yeah. I, well, I just I just kind of wanted to say on the on the social end um, that you know that is that is really huge uh, for us at Huffington Post. Um, just you know pushing it out through all kinds of channels and uh, you know Facebook engagement uh, and Twitter. And I mean, I mean that's that's kind of been the most amazing thing to see about this project is is just how it's kind of taken off in social media and and also you know. I, you know, I, I think it helps to grow the audience because, I, you know, people like you're saying, like, like not not everyone not everyone is coming to HuffingtonPost.com homepage. You know, that's not that's not really how people consume news that much these days. But but I think also the idea that there's an investigative piece on Huffington Post that that someone sees on Twitter, um, it gets people there. Who, who who may not have originally gone, and then and then maybe 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 they'll come back, you know, and that's that's the hope is that we keep delivering stuff that that surprises people. How do you um, how do you and I guess your editors measure impact? Because when it comes to investigative reports, it might not necessarily be that you got a million views or five hundred comments or things like that. Um, it also might mean you know a change in culture, a change in society, a, a, you know, a change in the way that let's say with your report. That states work with private prisons. Um, is there a way that you guys have? Because I know this is a big question that a lot of foundations are dealing with, and a lot of nonprofits. But how, you know, is there a way you guys measure impact? Is there a kind of a unified way to look at it? I mean, it's there's no real exact science, but I mean, I, th I think it's I, I think it's the same thing that that any news organization, you know. Throughout time, you know, I, me measures their effectiveness. You know, which I, I think it's. Um, you know, we're yeah, we're 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 not being held accountable for for hitting traffic goals on this. You know, the, this piece, the amount of resources that went into this is not. You know, this is not. Uh, this is not uh, a, a huge. This is not something that can be replicated for traffic purposes. We we do it for a different reason. But I think I think ultimately, yeah, we, we you know we hope that something changes as a result of this, and and we're gonna you know keep working on that, um, it, you know, in the, in, in the coming weeks. Um, and, and also, you know, I think just in terms of people talking about this, that, that's another thing that we like to see. You know, we like to see, you know, who has mentioned it, who has shared it, um, you know, if, if it's getting written up in other publications or blogs. Um, that's something we like to see. You know, we like to, we like to sort of cut coming on PBS Media Shift. You know, I mean, I mean that's, that's kind of, that's, that's what we want to do. You know, we, we kind of just want our names out there and kind of in the mix. Makes sense. Well, thanks a lot. I really appreciate you joining us. It's interesting to see what um, these kind of digital native um, organizations are doing with investigations, and we hope that uh, you'll continue to do the great work that you're doing. Uh, we want to thank uh, Andrew Lee from American, uh, also Chris Kirkham from Huffington Post, Claire Grodin from PBS Media Shift, our intern, Mark Schufs. Uh, from BuzzFeed, formerly ProPublica, and Earl Norton, now the new executive producer at ABC News Digital. I also want to thank USC Annenberg for sponsoring the podcast and remind you of our event coming up next month in New York, The Truth and Trust in the 21st Century at Ford Foundation Headquarters. Hope you'll join us. And join us every week on Fridays at 1.30 p.m. Eastern for the Media Twits. Have a great week, everyone.